I don't know if there's any other educators in the room. Um, I think some of your statements um, maybe aren't fair because being in education many years from kindergarten to tertiary, there are a lot of teachers who give a lot, who use examples, who teach in a practical way. And a lot of universities, including many here, um, have either moved in that direction and, you know, other places in the world have this. So what is different about Minerva? That's why I'm here. So there are a number of ways in which when you want to create a, a curricular system to teach it that you have to, um, to design. And one of the big uh, differences between the Minerva system and, um, and the system in most universities is that in most universities, the unit of education is the course. It is a teacher, a professor, that designs a, an instructional segment and then delivers that. Now, the disadvantage of that system is that oftentimes a professor, in fact, I would argue all of the times, a professor um, has a very finite amount of space in order to be able to deliver that broad-based education. And in order to actually provide instincts, learned instincts, you must deliver it with spaced, deliberate practice. And that spaced, deliberate practice can rarely occur even in a couple of months. Usually it needs to be practiced over several years, right, to really generate that kind of understanding. And so, the examples that we gave, you know, uh, evaluating claims and sunk costs and things like that, we don't just teach that in the course of, you know, one or two classes and just say, oh, let's give examples, examples. We introduce the concept, we foreground the habit or concept as the subject of the course, right, rather than a subject that then is used to illustrate the idea. We give a taxonomy, these hashtags, Right, so that students are able to uh, begin to recognize it. And then we take four years in which we not just introduce these habits and concepts, which we do at the beginning, but where they are practiced, assessed, and provided formative feedback to the students in both how they apply them as well as in what context they apply them. And it's only through that process, where you have 30 different professors teaching 30 different courses that incorporate these habits and concepts as examples, then do you start seeing, and you start seeing it, of course, in, in the beginning, but you see pretty dramatic increases as they get interleaved from course to course and context to context, right? In traditional educational systems, because they are fundamental, uh, higher educational systems, K-12 is very, very different. And the higher educational systems, because they are so subject matter driven, it is very rare for a university to be able to provide that scaffold such that when a professor were to say, okay, now let me, I'm going to teach you anthropology, right? And in anthropology, here are all of these taxonomical ways of of looking at anthropology in the same way that somebody is now teaching you biology, in some way that somebody teaches you economics. Remember, you know, last year when you were introduced this idea, here it is again, right? Or, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it's here, but I'm waiting for you to apply it. And if you don't apply it, I'm going to say, hey, what about this concept? Why didn't you use sunk costs, right? That's a curricular approach. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have, uh, in the, in the, uh, the history of, of, of our being human beings, we've not really lived in a technological age, right? That's a very recent phenomenon. And the ability to pass data from one professor to another and how students progress across all of these different aspects was really impossible until a very recent time ago. And that, and that is the key insight, that when you use data and information to be able to track how students progress over time on dozens of different learning objectives across a couple of dozen different professors and help students advance their intellectual progression along those lines, right? That's the difference. It's a systematic approach as opposed to a, a, a solitary approach, right? Which can, of course, have real impact, but 
limited just because of the scope of it. I think the other thing also is that Minerva adopts uh, technology in to 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 uh, tr um, basically deliver these fully active classes. So fully active learning is something when you first look at it, it bears no resemblance to any class that you've ever had in your life. And you know, I do a lot of work with deep human skills. So to me, I've always had this prejudice that an online class is inferior or a substitute to a virtual, uh, you know, uh, face, uh, sorry, to a face-to-face -face class. So the first time I saw uh, a Minerva class, I was frankly blown away. So imagine that, you know, you've got eight faces of students on the screen and each student's face is slowly changing a different color according to how long the student has interacted or not interacted with the professor. And at any one point of time, there is a sort of, um, what do you call it, not script, what do you call it, stage direction? Stage directions, stage, yeah. Okay, so the professor teaching has a minute by minute guide on what the professor is supposed to be doing. So for instance, at minute number three, professor could be cute, hey Ben, give me your opinion about this and illustrate whatever with a habit of concept, whatever. So Ben's going to start and then the middle of that, the professor will cut Ben off and say, Elaine, I want you to finish Ben's thought. Where was he going with this? And Elaine has to come in and finish his thought in a way that is logical. And all the time, by the way, all the other students have a dial that where they're voting yes or no uh, in accordance to what is being say, said. And then the, the, the teacher can cut Elaine off and say, okay, Elaine, stop there, Rob. I would like you to summarize so far in this entire class, what was the best argument, what was the worst argument, et cetera. At every single minute of this class, you are fully engaged and you're in the front row and there is no way for you to hide. I mean, make no mistake, you will learn by the end of the class. Yeah, so the, I think the, the key insight into fully active learning is that you know, the, the, the professors are, I mean, the name professor comes from the concept of professing, right? Effectively, like, disseminating. Um, but our professors don't profess. What they do is they advance intellectual uh, growth. And, and so rather than, than having, you know, notes for a professor saying, you know, at this point you disseminate this piece of information, then you say that, that piece of the lecture, et cetera, instead what we do is we say, okay, in these next 10 minutes, it's time for an intellectual relay. So begin a question, right, you know, and then pick a student you want to pick on, and then begin that process of, of you know, stopping and calling on somebody else, stopping some calling somebody else, et cetera. See where the conversation goes, follow it, right, and make sure that people are engaged, right? You see somebody turning to the right, and the camera's on their face so the professor can see it, call on that person next, right? That's part of the training of keeping people engaged. Why is this important? It's important because when studies have been done, same professor, same subject matter, same quality of students, right? This was done uh, 20 years ago initially and has been replicated dozens of times across many institutions. When you have the same professor teaching the same class in a typical test and lecture based methodology, and then you go at, after the end of the semester, six months, and ask the students to take a similarly difficult final exam, but with different questions, of course, the retention rate is 10%. 10%. So 90% of what students knew at the time of the final, they've forgotten by the time they, they take this test. You take, again, same quality students, and meaning in the initial case it was Harvard first year students, same professor teaching the same class, in an active learning way. The professor doesn't lecture, the students instead read the material um, outside of class, and they come into class and then they do problem sets together instead of doing them alone at home, and the professor walks around and gives students uh, perspectives. And this is what we refer to as semi-active learning. Two-year retention after the end of class is 70%. So I just wanna put this in perspective. The difference between 10% retention to 70% retention right, is a far bigger delta than trying to cure a disease with a sugar pill versus with antibiotics. Right? Placebos 
will cure disease 30% of the time. Pure placebo. Right? Whereas an antibiotic would be, uh, you know, if the antibiotic is tailored, would do it kind of 80 to 90% of the time. This is a bigger effect, and it's not fully active learning, it's semi-active learning. And this research has been known and replicated for decades, yet has barely influenced official policy of nearly any university anywhere in the world. Now you can imagine that people have discovered penicillin, right? And can you imagine hospitals saying, eh, we'll stick with leeches, right? And so, not only is it important to change the curricular approach, the pedagogical approach is really crucial to change, otherwise people just won't retain it. 